ओम नमो भागवते Yagriya 
it does. But but it does. It does. Certainly that. Certainly that. Yat. Yat. Which. Which. Reyamanai. Reyamanai. In spite of chanting. In spite of chanting. Harinama. Harinama. The holy name of the Lord. The holy name of the Lord. Deyai. Deyai. By concentration of the mind. By concentration of the mind. Na. Na. Does not. Does not. The creator changes. Changes. Ata. Ata. Thus. Thus. Yada. Yada. When. When. Vikara. Vikara. Reaction. Reaction. Nitre. Nitre. In the eyes. In the eyes. Galam. Galam. Tears. Tears. Gatra. Rupeshu. Gatra. Rupeshu. Of of the pores. And the pores. Hasha, Hasha, eruptions of ecstasy. Eruptions of ecstasy. Translation: Certainly, that heart is still framed, which, in spite of one's chanting the holy name of the Lord with concentration, does not change when ecstasy takes place. Tears. Fill the eyes and the hairs stand on end. You can repeat. Certainly that heart, Certainly that heart is still framed, is still framed which, in spite, which in spite of one's chanting, of one's chanting the, holy name of the, Lord, the holy name of the Lord with concentration, the concentration does not change. Not does not change. When ecstasy, takes place, when ecstasy takes place, tears fill the eyes, tears fill the eyes and the hair stand on end. And the hair stand on end. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. We should note with profit that in the first three chapters, of the second canto, a gradual process of development of devotional service is being presented. In the first chapter, the first steps of devotional service for God consciousness by the process of hearing and chanting has been stressed. And the a gross conception of the personality of Godhead in His universal form for the beginners is recommended. By, by such gradual conception of God through the material manifestation of His energy, one is enabled to spiritualize the mind and the senses and gradually concentrate the mind upon Lord Vishnu, the Supreme, who is present as the Super Soul in every heart and everywhere in every atom of the material universe. The system of Panch Upasana recommending, recommending five mental attitudes for the common man is also enacted for this, this purpose, namely gradual development, worship of the Supreme that may be in the form of fire, electricity, the sun, the mass of living beings, Lord Shiva, and at long last the impersonal super soul, the partial representation of Lord Vishnu. They are all nicely described in the second chapter, but in the third chapter further development is prescribed after one has actually reached the stage of Vishnu worship are pure devotional service and the mature stage 
of Vishnu worship is suggested herein in relation to the change of heart. Maybe we'll go through this purport paragraph by paragraph because it's a long purport. We won't finish the whole purport today. This is an important verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada has given a length, lengthy purport to it. So we will try to consider what is being described here. First of all, Shona Karishi is speaking to the sages in Naima Sharanya forest. And he was describing, remember we spoke the previous classes about people who have ears like the holes of the snake and tongue like the frog and legs like the stump of a tree and then yesterday we heard about people who are like ghosts or dead people because they don't want to take the dust from the pure devotees and they never smell the aroma of the tulsi leaves offered at the lotus feet of the Lord. So all of those different things were describing people who were not having any attraction to hearing about the glories of Lord Krishna. Now, Shona Karishi is going a little further here today and he's speaking about people who chant the holy name and even it's described they chant the holy name with concentration which you know often we have difficulty to do we chant the holy name but often without concentration but here it's describing someone chants a holy name with we want the translation? No? So um, so, um, so chanting the holy name with concentration but uh, Yes, the ladies can have translation, that'd be nice. So, chanting the holy name with concentration. Yeah. Go ahead, Manaji. Yeah. Did you see me? You want translation? You're okay? So, People chant the holy name with concentration and even they're chanting the holy name with concentration and they're experiencing, experiencing bhava because it's described they chant the holy name and tears in their eyes and uh, what uh, their eyes filled with tears and the hair stand on end so these are all symptoms of bhava. So even though they're chanting the holy name with bhava, but there's no change in heart. There's no change in the heart. So this is said that their heart must be steel framed. You know steel framed? It means very hard hearted. People who are chanting the holy name like that with concentration and at the level of bhava but their hearts are not changing. So it said, Sona Karishi says their heart is steel framed. It means their heart is very hard. If it's framed in steel, you're not going to be able to, to bend it or anything. Very hard. 
So someone's hard hearted means they have no they've not developed any feeling somehow for for the Lord. So Swami Karishi is describing this kind of person. So Srila Prabhupada begins a purport and he is talking about the progression which is there in the second canto. Remember at the end of the first canto, Sukadeva Goswami had appeared. Maharaj Parikshit wanted someone to guide him and then Sukadeva Goswami appeared and it was understood by everyone that Sukadeva Goswami was the right person to guide Maharaj Parikshit because they were both they were both devotees of Lord Krishna. Sukadeva Goswami was the son of Srila Vyasadeva, who is a devotee of Krishna, and Maharaj Parikshit is the grandson of Arjuna. And all of the Pandavas were very staunch devotees of Lord Krishna. So although Sukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit did not have anything in common really with each other. They were coming from very different environments. Sukadeva Goswami was the renunciate, totally detached from the world. His father was a rishi living in the, in the mountains, in the Himalayas. And Sukadeva Goswami took birth immediately he left home he didn't even stay at home to receive the sacred thread which his father wanted to give him. He just left home. He was so detached. And Maharaj Parikshit, on the other hand, he is a Kshatriya. And he was the son of Arjuna, so he, he was, became the emperor of the world after the Pandavas retired. The Pandavas all retired and went to the Himalayas and Maharaj Parikshit became the ruler. So he was ruling the kingdom and he was living in the palace, in the royal order, with all the trimmings of royalty, meaning many servants and a lot of opulence. So his lifestyle was very different from that of Sukadeva Goswami. But when Maharaj Parikshit renounced after he had been cursed to die in seven days, so Maharaj Parikshit immediately renounced everything, gave up everything, and went to look for someone to give him guidance to prepare for how to use his time best for leaving the world. And that time Sukadeva Goswami appeared and they, uh, they both agreed. Maharaj Parikshit wanted Sukadeva Goswami and Sukadeva Goswami agreed to speak to Maharaj Parikshit. So Sukadeva Goswami began speaking and he did not begin speaking immediately about devotional service. But he did speak about the importance of hearing and chanting. But then he went on to describe about how one could contemplate the Supreme Lord through the universe. Contemplating the form of the Lord through the different elements of the material creation. So this kind of realization is helpful for people who are materialistic and who have attachments to the material world. They're not fully ready to understand the Lord in his deity form. It's difficult for some people to come and see the Lord in the form of a deity and to understand that this is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
but they find it easier to contemplate the Absolute through the universe. And of course the system is to describe all of the different parts, elements in the universe as being part of the body of the Supreme Lord. Just like we say the sun is like the eye of the Lord. And the moon, that is the mind of the Lord. Lord Brahma is the intelligence of the Lord. And the upper planetary systems, they're like the upper part of the body of the Lord. And the lower planets are the, the legs and feet of the Lord. And the Brahmanas are like the head, the Kshatriyas are the arms, the Vaishya the belly, the Sutras the legs. The rivers are like veins on the body of the Lord. Just as rivers, the water is flowing through the rivers down to the sea. So the same with in our veins, the blood is flowing through the body. So the rivers are like veins in the universal body and the trees on the planet are all like hairs on the body of the Supreme Lord. And in this way every different phenomena in the world can be related to the form of the Supreme. So this is an impersonal description of the Lord. This is not the highest stage of realization, but it's a step forward. It helps people to understand that there's some supreme behind the universe and to see the form of the supreme in the universe. Because not everyone can see God just by coming to the temple. They don't have that vision. So Sukadeva Goswami began his description like that. And after explaining that, then he went on in the second chapter to talk about contemplating the Lord in the heart of all living entities, as the super soul in the hearts of everyone. And Prabhupada mentions about the system of Pancha Upasana how they will worship five deities. Now if you go to a, a, a typical Hindu temple, you will see that they have something like that. We used to joke that the, the Hindu temple have all the gods. They have all the gods, everyone is there. Shiva is there, Brahma is there. Just yesterday, when we were down at the riverside, there was one temple there, an ancient temple, one of the oldest temples in Melaka. It's a Miriman, Miriman temple, but there were many other deities there. They had Kali Avatar, they had Naga, they had Ganesha, and, like that, there were many different deities there. So sometimes people, they will worship these different deities, how they represent the different elements in the universe. And, and Prabhupada mentions like that, about fire and air. And so there, this way people start to understand that there's some controlling forces within the universe that not, it, it is not just independent but there are some living entities above us higher on a higher level and they they have powers and they control the different natures in this world and then they contemplate that there's also the Lord in the heart of every living entity is the super soul. And of course, yogis, they will do that. They will contemplate the super soul in the heart. 
they sit and they meditate on the super soul in the heart. This is the object of the Astanga Yoga system. Meditation on the super soul. And so it's elevates people from the material platform. They can contemplate the form of the Supreme. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, you can read about uh, Kardama Muni. How Kardama Muni meditated, he did Astanga Yoga for 10,000 years. Because it was not Kali Yuga, it was Satya Yuga. People lived a hundred thousand years, so he spent ten thousand years doing meditation. And he meditated on the super soul. You get people today, they meditate on all funny things, you know. One person told me, he said he didn't like to worship Krishna because Krishna has a mother and father. He said, he couldn't be God. He said, Shiva is God. Shiva is light. So they meditate on light. So some places you go, they just have a light and they just sit and meditate on the light. So that's their realization of the absolute truth. So at least they, they're contemplating some higher nature. They can understand there's something, some force, some form, or something above us and we are not supreme, that there are some higher forces there. But they don't know very much about them. So they may think of God simply in the form of some energy like fire or light. Other people may think of God in the form of the super soul. That's the localized feature of God. Localized is in the heart. But there's more to be understood. So Sukadeva Goswami began like this. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita, we see how the Bhagavad Gita also progresses. There's a yoga ladder. Krishna describes Karmakanda and then from Karmakanda then he talks about Karma Yoga and then after Karma Yoga he talks about Jnana Yoga and then he talks about Dhyana Yoga and then at the end of the sixth chapter he talks about Bhakti and says Bhakti is the top and then he goes on chapter 7 to describe about Bhakti Yoga. So here also in Srimad Bhagavatam, you can see there's also a progression in the first few chapters. First, Sukadeva Goswami was speaking about the Vishwarup, the universal form, and seeing the whole universe as a form of the Supreme. And then he went on to speak about the Super Soul, how the Lord is in the heart of everyone, every living entity, that He is there within the heart as the Super Soul. Of course, the function of the Super Soul is given to us in the Bhagavad Gita, right? The Lord Krishna describes Sarvashya Chaham Ritisani Vista. Lord Krishna said, I am in the hearts of all living entities and from me comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. And in the 13th chapter, Lord Krishna describes there that he is also Upadrista and Anamanta, that he is the overseer and the maintainer of all living entities. As the super soul, he's overseeing everything. Just like if you work in a job, those of you, if you work in a job, you know there's always some supervisor 
somebody overseeing what you do and you're saying, no, no, you haven't done this right, do it again, and like that. You know, there's always an overseer. So, the super soul is there in the heart, overseeing everything, watching everything, and sometimes guiding us, sometimes correcting us, and sometimes rewarding us. This is the super soul. And also the super soul is also the permitter of activities, the sanctions, the different things which we do. So this was the second chapter and then come to the third chapter to describe more about the Lord as a person, that He is not only in the hearts of all living entities, but He has His own individual existence and he has his own personality and he has his own pastimes and his family and all of his friends and he has his own abode. He's separate from everything as well. He's within everything but he is outside of everything also. So this is uh, the third chapter. We will read some more from Prabhupada's purport here. The whole process of spiritual culture is aimed at changing the heart of the living being in the matter of his eternal relation with the Supreme Lord as subordinate servant, which is his eternal constitutional position. So, with the progress of devotional service, the reaction of change in the heart is exhibited by gradual detachment from the sense of material enjoyment, by a false sense of lording it over the world, and an increase in the attitude of rendering loving service to the Lord. Vidhi Bhakti or regulative devotional service by the limbs of the body, namely the eyes, the ears, the nose, the hands and the legs, as already explained herein before, is now stressed herein in relation to the mind, which is the impetus for all activities of the limbs of the body. It is expected by all means that by discharging regulated devotional service one must manifest the change in heart. If there is no such change, the heart must be considered steel framed, for it is not melted even when there is chanting of the holy name of the Lord. We must always remember that hearing and chanting are the basic principles of discharging devotional duties. And if they are properly performed, there will follow the reactional ecstasy with signs of tears in the eyes, and standing of the hairs on the body. These are natural consequences and are the preliminary symptoms of the bhava stage, which occurs before one reaches the perfectional stage of prema, love of God. All right, so. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us about the process of devotional service that is based on the foundation is hearing and chanting. And with hearing and chanting, then the effects of the hearing and chanting is such that one should develop detachment from material sense gratification. So that, that should be the natural result of devotional service. But the 
that is only the beginning. That when we, we begin, we take more interest in hearing and chanting and less interest in the mundane things. That is the beginning of the devotional process. We have to go on from there to develop the higher stages of devotion. So Prabhupada mentions how there is Vaidhi Bhakti, which means devotional service according to the rules and regulations. But above Vaidhi Bhakti, there is Bhava Bhakti, and Bhava Bhakti goes on to Prima Bhakti. Bhava Bhakti means devotional service in ecstasy, and Prima Bhakti is devotional service in love of God. So Bhava and Prima, they're very elevated stages of devotion. And we have to come to these levels after, only after a lot of intense practice of devotion. But even at Bhava, even at the level of Vaidhi Bhakti, one can be a pure devotee. It's not that because one doesn't have Bhava or Prima that you're not a devotee or you're not a pure devotee. Vaidhi Bhakti a Vaini Bhakta can also be a pure devotee, following the rules and regulations. Prabhupada was asked, beside the devotee as Prabhupada, beside you Prabhupada, are there any other pure devotees on the planet? And Prabhupada said, all the members of this God are pure devotees. He said, all the members of this God are pure devotees, because they are following the principles, they're not doing anything sinful. So that is the mode of pure devotion. But there are different levels of pure devotees. We have to understand there are pure devotees like the Vyasadev and Narada Muni, and there are pure devotees like Prabhupada, and there are pure devotees like us. You see that there are different levels of pure devotees. Not that all pure devotees are all on the same level. There's all different levels of devotees. Some pure devotees, they're gopis in the spiritual world, and other pure devotees may be cowherd boys. So somebody may say, oh, the gopis are more advanced than the cowherd boys. Well, <laughs> no, it's not like that, really because the cowherd boys are also very special souls, that they have performed pious activities over many lifetimes. In order to be friends with Krishna and to take part in Krishna's pastimes, they have to have performed pious activities for a long time. And they're very pure souls. And similarly the gopis also, they're not ordinary ladies. They're all great souls who somehow they've come to that level of loving Krishna. Without thinking that Krishna is God, they simply want to give everything. They sacrifice everything for Krishna. So there's the, there are these three different levels of devotional service. Vaiti Bhakti is also divided into there, there's Vaidhi Bhakti and there's also Raganuga Bhakti. Raganuga Bhakti is also uh, like Vaidhi Bhakti. But Vaidhi Bhakti comes first. So we are doing Vaidhi Bhakti. We follow the rules and regulations. Rules and regulations mean like coming to Arti, seeing the deities, performing kirtan, studying scriptures, reciting prayers, all of these different activities. The activities of devotion, taking part in festivals, and decorating the temple, and decorating the deities. All of this is all part of 
devotional service at Vaiti Bhakti. We are doing all of these different things as part of our service to Krishna. We follow the different rules. There are many rules mentioned in the nectar of devotion. I think there are 64 items. And from these 64 items, stress is given on five items. Rupa Goswami has selected five items and he said, if you have a little attraction for any one of these five items, it can allow you to achieve the supreme perfection. So these five items are what we call Panch Anga Bhakti. And so the first one is hearing the glories of the Lord from the scriptures like Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. And second thing is Sankirtan, performing Sankirtan. We had nice Sankirtan yesterday. So that is also an important part of Vaidhi Bhakti. You hear and you do also Sankirtan and then also worshipping the deity. Worshipping the deity is not only going on the altar but coming and seeing the deity and bowing before the deity and offering prayers to the deity and performing kirtan for the deity. All of the things we do in the temple room, they're for the pleasure of the deity. We're speaking Srimad Bhagavatam every day for the pleasure of the deity because the deity can see, the deity can eat, and the deity also hears. So we have to understand the deity worship is important, sankirtan is important, hearing is also important, then also association with devotees. Sometimes people think, oh, I will just do on my own. I will just do my own. I will sit, I will read the books, I will have my own deities, I will just do everything at home. Yeah. Then without association, you don't advance very easily because you don't have association. Performing kirtan is much more pleasurable with devotees. You can do kirtan on your own, but it's not going to be quite the same as when you have all the devotees with you to do kirtan. And similarly, you can read the books, but it's much better to discuss with the devotees and to explain and to discuss with the devotees. You just sit and read the book on your own. How much do you understand? There will be so many things we don't know what's being said. So it's very important to understand the value of association. Indeed, Srila Prabhupada said that our spiritual advancement depends 98% on association. So association is one of the five items. And then the fifth item is to live in a holy place. Live in a holy place. So, temple is like a holy place. So you come and visit the temple regularly. It is as good as going to the holy place. And wherever the scriptures are being read and discussed, wherever the devotees are, that is a holy place. And Srimad Bhagavatam, Maharaj Yudhisthira was glorifying Vidura. And he said to Vidura, Bhavad Vidir Bhagavatas Tirta Buddha Swayamribo Tirti Kurvanti Tirtani Swantastena Gadavrita. The Maharaj Yudhisthira glorified Vidura. He said that you are the personification of the holy place because you carry the Lord in your heart. So wherever you go, you purify that place. So if you get the association of a 
devotee like Vidura, then that is like a holy place. So these five items, very important. And all of these five items are in our morning program. If you come for the morning program in the temples like that, we have all of these five items. So very powerful. If you take the advantage of some temple or devotee association and you have a morning program, then you can make very good advancement in Krishna consciousness. So these five items, they're the essence of the, all the rules and regulations. And you could say above all these five things, the most important thing is always remember Krishna or Vishnu and never forget him. That is the most important. All right, are there any questions? Yes, Hare Krishna Guru. Guru Maharaj, when we do chanting, we chant loudly so that we can hear through the mind. But when we want to remember the Lord intensively, we want to say that we want to remember through the heart. How the mind and heart is going to work in this matter? When we chant, we only concentrate into the mind. But they are not putting into the heart. How do we go together with this? Well, where is the mind? Mind. Mind. mind? Where is your mind? Where is your mind? No, that's your brain, not your mind. the mind on Krishna, your heart, but that's how you clean the heart. If your mind is on Krishna, then your heart will be clean. Cheto darpanam marjanam, right? Cleanse the mirror of the mind by chanting the holy name. Can we approach Goloka Vrindavana without Prima? Yeah. Well, there are uh, yeah, that the process to go to Goloka Vrindavana is you have to develop the mood of the people of Vrindavana. So you select a resident of Vrindavana and you follow their example. So that is called Raganuga Bhakti. Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti. You can you can go to Vrindavan. Not that you have to have prema. You can go to Vrindavan. You, you have to have the mood to be the servant. That's the important. But if Krishna is the master and we are the servant, you come to Vrindavan in the mood of being a humble servant. If you think you have to have prema, then you never go to Vrindavan. Prema is something very special. You may get it, you may not. It's not very common. But you can go to Vrindavan without prima. Bhava and prima, these things are given with special mercy of, the, of Krishna or Krishna's very special devotee that they can give these kind of things. But Prabhupada was a resident of Vrindavan and Prabhupada was always telling us we could also come to Vrindavan, we can also go to Vrindavan. But we have to have the mood to be the servant. That we, we don't just come to enjoy 
we are meant to be enjoyed by Krishna. We are subordinate to Krishna. So devotee, devotee always considers himself to be fallen and unqualified. Dhruva Maharaj didn't go to didn't go to Goloka, he went to Vaikuntha. But he did a sadhana in Vrindavan. When he when he was doing his austerities, he was there in Madhuvan in Vrindavan. And the Lord appeared to him there. But later on he went to Badarik Ashram. And then the aeroplane came from Vaikuntha and he went to Vaikuntha. Well, he went first to the Pope Star, and then from the Pope Star he will go to Vaikuntha. So, so not everyone is a resident of Vrindavan. But the spiritual world accommodates all the pure devotees. You have to have, you want to go to Goloka Vrindavan, you have to cultivate the mood of certain rich passive people. You take, you take a particular person, you want to develop their mood and you follow that mood. You become absorbed in thinking of that person. So that is the process of Raganuga Bhakti. Just like you want to be like Mother Yashoda. So you meditate on Mother Yashoda and you remember all Mother Yashoda's activities and all Mother Yashoda's uh, different things which she said and her behavior and like that and, you, and you, you concentrate on her, on her particular activities and her mood, how she's always singing songs about Krishna and she's always thinking about Krishna. So you follow that mood of Mother Yashoda and then you can also go to Goloka as an elderly gopi like Mother Yashoda. But not everybody has the nature to be a resident of Vrindavan. Someone else's nature may be to, to be a resident of Vaikuntha. Someone's a resident of Dwarka. Someone else is a resident of Ayodhya. In different places. So we have to recognize the different natures of devotees. But different devotees for themselves, they have to recognize their taste. What is their particular attraction? Which particular mood of Krishna is attracting their mind the most and they become absorbed in serving a particular devotee. And following that mood. Okay. Yes? This, for my understanding, some says uh, the rules and regulations are not important, but for the beginners, as I understand the beginners, it's important in rules and regulations in my session, and uh, without proper understanding of Vaidhi uh, Bhakti, rules and regulations, how one can progress into Bhava Bhakti or Prima Bhakti. Well, of course, if you don't follow the rules and regulations, then you won't progress to Bhagavan If you're not following the, 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 the rules and regulations in Vaidhi Bhakti, how will you go to the higher things? It's not likely. Not, not, anyway, it's not very common. But Lord Krishna likes to see the devotees follow the different principles. Lord Chaitanya appreciated when the devotees were very careful about 
following Vaishnava etiquette. He, he would often test the devotees even to see how much they would follow the Vaishnava etiquette. And he would appreciate that when, when the devotees are very careful to follow the rules and regulations and the Vaishnava etiquette, then certainly Krishna is present. So, you could say, well, Krishna is everywhere, but, but, but he's more present where the devotees are following the rules and regulations. He's everywhere, but he doesn't reveal himself. And if the devotees are not following the rules and regulations, then Krishna thinks, oh, these people, you know, he's not impressed. He's not very much happy with them. So he won't reveal himself. Thank you, Shah Guru Maharaj. Um, with regards to yesterday's class, I have a question. Um, uh, we hear the pastime of the, Sa the Sanat Kumaras, they approach Lord Vishnu and then by inhaling the fragrance of the Tulusi, they develop Bhakti. So they are, we understand that they are liberated souls. I was just wondering, they did not have association with devotees. They were not having any of this five principles and yet just by inhaling the fragrance of the policy they were able to develop a why do you think they didn't have association no, before that there was prior huh i mean they were followers of the jnana path isn't it the but they were sons of lord brahma yeah. and they heard from lord brahma i mentioned that that they'd heard about the lord from lord brahma but somehow they were more attracted to the impersonal brahman but they had heard about the, the Supreme Absolute Truth, the Supreme Lord. They'd heard about Him from Lord Brahma. They just felt more attracted. Their inclination was more to the Brahman. But as the sons of Brahma, they had heard. They, had, they did have association. And they reside up there in Tapaloka, Janaloka. It's all very great pure souls there. So they have a lot of association. Just one question, Guru Maharaj. Um, is it two questions? Number one, Guru Maharaj mentioned that uh, always remember Krishna and not forget Krishna. When we present this to uh, in class or anything, uh, the counter will be, uh, yes, that's right, but why do you need to be physically appearing like this? We remember Krishna in the heart. Why your outward look is so important, all these things. They, they tend to uh, ask us back. <coughs> Number two, um, uh, like Guru Maharaj mentioned that um, this uh, Raga and Prima all these are very very elevated uh, subject matters. But we can see in some discourses in among our devotees they tend to go into the pastimes of uh, deep pastimes of the Lord. Even though Sri Prabhupada did not did this in any way, any of his discourse. Uh, and some devotees seems to relishing this uh, like I mean uh, you can see like there is so much uh, into the classes, but when we speak like what is philosophy is, they like it's like they're not interested. So when we go and ask the speaker, then they tend to say, um, as you advance, then you can reach all these things. So how can we understand and uh, correlate these things? For us? Because this is, I mean, we are experiencing this, these things are going on. Yes, well. We should hear from Prabhupada. Uh, hear what Prabhupada is saying. And that's the same thing. Now, of course, there's so many books being published by so many different people. But you're much safer. You're worried like if you're worried about these things, then just stick to Srila Prabhupada's books. Just follow Prabhupada's books. And everything is there in Prabhupada's books. Of course, if you want to hear about Radha and Krishna, it's also there. It's in Prabhupada's books. You know, Prabhupada published the Krishna book very early on in the Krishna consciousness movement. And that Krishna book describes the Rasa Lila, and describes the gopis and coming to be with Krishna and dancing all night with Krishna. 
And so it just describes the pastimes of Krishna, but describes them in a manner in which even neophyte devotees can understand these things. So, uh, generally these things are not for public discussion, but Prabhupada did write about them in the books. So, among devotees, they may, sometimes they may bring up these things and discuss them. Now, even devotees have published books about Rasa Leela, one of the devotees in America, he did his PhD thesis on Rasa Leela, you know, so all of these things are there. You have to, you have to deal with these different things. People want to know, they will ask questions about it. So we have to know, we have to be able to speak to them and tell them what, what it is, what's taking place. So we do speak, we want to follow, generally, the mood of the Goswamis, follow in the footsteps of the Goswamis, follow the Acharyas, and speak what they've spoken. If we're repeating the words of the Acharyas, then that's safe. You know, if it's there in Prabhupada's books, it's safe, and you're just repeating what's there in Prabhupada's books. And if you're saying something else and you never heard it before, where is it? I don't know. And of course, a lot of things come up, a lot of questions come up. It's difficult to answer some things, you know. And sometimes the Acharyas, they don't speak about certain issues. The Acharyas didn't comment. And somebody else, they're asking you to comment, you know, what can, what can you say, you know? If the Acharyas themselves didn't comment on this, why, how, how can I comment on it? What we, all we can do is repeat what we've heard from the Acharyas. So that's safe. But do you want to give your own commentary? You know, some, you think say something new that's not very advisable. Can we consider that as a deviation from Prabhupada's book? Uh, from, uh, huh? Can we consider that kind of uh, explanation is deviated from the Prabhupada's explanation? No? What? Prabhupada, sorry, Prabhupada has given very clear explanation in every aspect. And then uh, they are further emphasizing more on this. Will that confuse people? And one more thing I just want to say, in the Guru Vandana, there is a translation given very much earlier. I saw in another book, that translation totally different. Well, we are following our founder, Acharya. We follow our... There are sometimes changes, like in the Vaishnava song book, they made some changes. Vaishnava song book, of course, that's not Prabhupada. But sometimes they put Prabhupada's purports there. Sometimes Prabhupada spoke on songs. But the translation for the songs, the translations were done, sometimes done by other people. And so somebody did the translation, then after some time somebody else comes along and says, no, no, that translation is wrong, it did, no, oh, it's no good, and they did give another translation. Yeah? So, you have to, we have to understand, you know, who did the translation? You say that the translation is completely different, but who did the translation? We don't know who did the translation, but it's in the main, uh, Songbook. Yeah, but the songbook, I said, the songbook was originally done by someone called Achyutananda. He was a Swami at the time. He came back. He went, he went out of his con for some time. Now he's back, but not, not as a Swami. His name is Achyutananda Das. He lives in Alachua, Florida now. And, you know, he's, he's a devotee, but maybe his knowledge of Sanskrit, Bengali, was not so good, but he did some attempt in translation and somebody else came 
one of the other editors in the BBC decided, no, no, this translation is not accurate, and they do it again. But you know, the nature of language, when you start translating, different people can translate in different ways. They, one can be, they, they can both be right, but they've just written it in a different way. So we have to understand, you know, that it's not directly Prabhupada's words that he wrote this, he said this. And so when it comes to the translation of a song, I don't think it was Prabhupada who translated it. He did some translation. He did. Generally he would give purports. His purports are there. Sometimes the translation is there in the book, the Bhagavatam translations, these things. And of course they are all edited, edited versions, Prabhupada's editors, the BBT editors. So, <laughs> you, the books have been changed in the course of time. The books have been through some changes. You know, Prabhupada wrote Sri Ishopanishad when he was in India, before he went to America, 1950s or something, he wrote Ishopanishad and the purports. And so, if you look at that edition and how the Ishopanishad is now, there's quite a difference. So, and they, do, they have changed things, they have been editing things, they feel, they oh no, this is, this, this is not right. And every time they get a new editor, they want to re-edit all the books again. <laughs> I mean, they must be translated from word to word, even from Sanskrit to any translation, word to word. But when they edit that, how they go into that, does it uh, change the meaning of the understanding? Well, you should know the language yourself, and you can give the translation. Right? If you know the words, you... Guru Raj is one question. I've seen, I've noticed that uh, Sometimes they sing our Vaishnava Acharya songs in their local language. Rather than, let's say it's in Bengali, they sing it in, let's say, English or Tamil or whatever. Is this really, uh, can we say, is it authorized or... <laughs> how, how can we understand this very much? Uh, we know they are singing for the locals or whatever, but it's not the language the Acharya has given us. Is it appropriate? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> the local people will like it, and of course, if it's in their language, they will appreciate it more. Bengali language is good for Bengalis, and the other songs, you know, just like Westerners, they also, they've written songs about Prabhupada, and, you know, some westernized tunes and songs. So for some time, popular, you know, doesn't usually last very long. But, you know, for Western people, new people coming to Krishna consciousness, then it's easier for them in the beginning. But to be confronted with songs in another language, I think it's difficult. Just like Chinese people, you know, they have a hard time when it comes to singing, like Guru Vastikam, you know. When you have to sing Guru Vastikam, it's, you know, it's totally foreign language. So, yeah, difficult. Definitely. That, see, the Buddhists, when they, when they brought Buddhism into China, they put a lot, they used a lot of Chinese words. So it made it much easier for people to take up Buddhism. Because the words are all Chinese. But for a Chinese-speaking person to read the Bhagavad Gita, and you get, you know, Buddha from Gur, 
<laughs> and then all the names, you know, what the Chinese, the, the Sanskrit names are all, you know, Govinda becomes Gawenda. <laughs> It's not, not very Chinese, you know. <laughs> not strange name, you know. Govinda. <laughs> yeah. This is supposed to be Govinda. Kishena. And there's no Ra. There's no Ra. So Ra Arma. Ra Arma. And some of the names are, the pronunciation is not there. So I could understand why they would put songs and so on into the local language. It certainly makes it much easier for people to pick up on the, on the message. Of course, we still have the basic songs for the morning program and you can't change the morning program, you know, you can't start singing Tamil in the morning program. <laughs> that Guru Vastika is Sanskrit, but the Tosi song, that's Bengali. Damodar Prish, Damodar Astakiram is Sanskrit. The Gora Arti is Bengali. Some places, Guru Maharaj, uh, especially in southern India, the original uh, verses are in Sanskrit. But what the people uh, say that we don't understand Sanskrit, we want to sing that in Tamil, that kind of thing should be going on. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. I could understand it. Certainly makes it much easier for them to digest in their own language. Oh yeah, I have the Vish, that Vish, what's his name? Vishnu Chaitanya. He's a quite a good musician, right? And he, he will sing songs in Tamil sometimes. He's got some songs in Tamil, which are Vaishnava songs. He's done that, got some songs in Tamil. Mm. But that also defeats the beauty of Guru Maharaj. For example, in, uh, in Balaji Temple, they start Kausavya Sopraja Ramakurva, but they translate it to the Tamil kind of uh, version. But the original tune is totally changed and the beauty also changed. Yeah. Yeah, that's what happens. We start changing. But you can see there's so many different versions of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. You've got in, in Indonesia, they have their own different versions of the Mahabharata and Ramayana. Everything changes that you start going away, further away, bringing the localized versions of these things. Numaraj, one final question. Uh, uh, I was talking to a devotee the other day. He was telling, uh, even to understand Prabhupada's purpose, it's getting tough nowadays. In future, maybe we need uh, someone else to because now Prabhupada's disciples are there, they are explaining to us all the intricate meanings of the Prophets. So as future goes on, these messages, uh, how will it be presented to the future generations? Well, we have to preserve the parampara. This is the whole purpose of parampara, that everything is received through parampara. And without parampara, then the message would be lost. But with the help of the parampara, it can all be preserved. We're here. Prabhupada is presenting it from, from parampara. And we have to also keep that parampara. But don't change, don't change the meaning. We shouldn't think, oh, because this is Malaysia, so things have to be different. Or be, you know, then, then we start to change everything, then the message is lost. And that's why Krishna had to come and speak the Bhagavad Gita again. Hmm? 
because the message was lost. Yoga nashta parantapa. Yoga nashta, the, the knowledge was lost. And Krishna had to come again and re establish the discipline of succession. So, these things happen in the course of time. Krishna spoke this knowledge to the sun god, Vibhiswan. What happened to it? Yoga nashta parantapa. The knowledge was lost. So Krishna had to come again and re establish. Okay, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai.